Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I have a riddle for you. A father and his son are involved in a car crash, and the man died at the scene. But when the child arrived at the hospital and was rushed into the operating room, the surgeon pulled away from him and said, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. How can this be? What is the reason for this refusal? I invite you to take a moment to think about this. The answer to this riddle is that the surgeon is the boy's mother. But why was it so difficult to guess? Why did it take us so long to figure it out? We are all influenced by thought categories and expectations which, which affect our daily behavior and affect our decision making. This happens to all of us and it's for good reason because it helps us simplify life. However, it also has disadvantages. For example, in this case, we were not able to guess that the surgeon is the boy's mother because we're used to surgeons being men in our society. Today, I wish to explore with you those thought processes, those biases and stereotypes which we succumb to, and I wish to do so in an interactive, experiential uh, manner together, okay? I invite you, uh, let's first explore the perceptions that we get from our basic senses. I invite you to look at this dress, the dress that divided the world. What color is it? Who saw white and gold? Please raise your hand. Okay. Now, who saw blue and black? Please raise your hand. This always causes disagreements. Now, I invite you to listen to this audio. Laurel. 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 Who heard Yanni? Please raise your hand. Who heard Laurel? Please raise your hand. <laughs> How is it possible that half the people in this room saw white and gold and the other half saw black and blue, and a part of the people today heard Yanni and the majority heard Laurel? Aren't our senses supposed to be objective? Most people think that hearing and listening or hearing and seeing occur in the eyes and the ears. But hearing and seeing actually occur in the brain and involve attributing meaning to the things that we are perceiving with our senses. And what we see and hear is very much affected by our expectations, by what we put our attention on first, by our um, language skills, and by other factors which we will come across throughout this talk today. Our minds fill in the blank of what we expect to see and hear, more than we are aware of it. There is no one objective reality. And I'll d the next exercise will demonstrate how our minds fill in the blank. I invite you to now try to read the following slide out loud with me. Super! This message serves to prove how our minds can do amazing things, impressive things. In the beginning it was hard, but now on this line your mind is reading it automatically without even thinking about it. Be proud, only certain people can read this. 
we, the majority of us were able to read this, although it's complete gibberish, although it's a, just a bunch of uh, letters and numbers which are not supposed to make sense. Still, our minds are able to make sense of them. Let's now go a level deeper and explore our social perceptions, okay? Here is where you would, I, I, I invite you to use the notebooks that you got while walking in. Please take a look at the four people on this screen and take a moment to think about what the name of the person in the picture might be. What do they do in their everyday life? Are they married, not married? What is their religion? Are they religious? What languages do they speak? What are their hobbies? What are their aspirations for the future? Let's all get back to the common space. Notice how quickly you were able to describe the life of a complete stranger or complete strangers from a picture only. You might have, you might have uh, possibly assumed that the person on the right is a migrant domestic worker or that the guy on the left is good at basketball that the veiled woman is religious or that the old man is retired. And all those assumptions, although we're not always aware of it, are things that are happening to us automatically when we're interacting with people around us, especially people who we do not know. And they are affected by the similarities that we might observe in those people based on other people that we might have engaged with or have met in the environments that we grew up in. The problem with stereotypes is not that they are completely false. It, it is that they are an incomplete perception of reality. Your assumptions of me are also affected by your perception of me, which might have changed when I changed my clothes. Now, some people now find me more relatable, while others less. Our biases and stereotypes happen in our minds and together with the information that we get from our basic senses constitute what we end up perceiving. We hear and we see what we expect to hear and see. And for good reason. I mean, we focus on certain aspects in our environment while ignoring others. This helps, helps us save energy, this helps us organize our environment, and this helps us reduce complexity. But there are instances where we want to look at complexity, where we want to look at diversity. Because diversity is a richness. And because if we don't look at diversity, there is the risk that we discriminate against others. That we discriminate based on age, based on gender, based on nationality, based on marital status, socioeconomic background, and other factors. I'm going to give you a couple of examples from my personal life. 
As was mentioned earlier, I'm a clinical psychologist. And in one of my intake interviews with a prospective client of mine, the man who I was meeting with told me where he lived. This information, together with his accent and his dialect, made me get, uh, guess which religious denomination he belonged to. This caused me to make an assumption that this man is religious, which led me to basically say, uh, use a faith-based expression, qada u qadar, which translates to faith-based fate. This put him off. At the end of the session, he told me I'm not religious, and this person, unfortunately, never came back. What this person needed from me was to engage deeper in that one topic. But instead, my answer to him felt it was similar to what he had already been hearing from his community and felt a little bit dismissive. And my worry is that this person might not have gone to another therapist after his experience with me, which is unfortunate because this person really needed it and he had been putting off our session for many months. Another example is from some 11 years ago. I was working in an organization that offers support services, rehabilitation services, to people who are refugees. One of my clients told me that he works in agriculture. He used to tow the land, um, plow the land, uh, plant seeds, and pick vegetables in season. Some, a few sessions into our work together, he spoke with the head of the rehabilitation unit and asked to change therapists, stating that the discussions with me were not deep enough. This, again, was because of an assumption that I made that this person was simple-minded. Why? Because he told me he's uneducated and he works in agriculture. A big, fat bias that I exercised against this person, which caused unintentional harm. 10,000 counseling and therapy sessions later, I can tell you that we are all, all of us programmed to fall into this tra trap of stereotyping. Why so? Because of the need to survive. We have inherited this mechanism from our ancestors who needed to make quick decisions whether a person approaching them was a friend or a foe. The, the law of the jungle prevailed. Those mechanisms no longer serve their purpose the same way they used to before, but they, we still have them. And they are the reason why we tend to stick to people who, are, who have similar thoughts as us, or who think in the same way as us, and to form biases and stereotypes against people who are different from us. But today I invite us to take a step back and to challenge our biases and stereotypes, to engage with others who are different from us, and to get to know them. How can we do so? By, or where we should do so is where we might be discriminating against others. For example, the, with people that are working in our homes, or with the janitor at school or maybe even with a supervisor on the floor that I uh, study in, or against maybe people who are refugees in the area that I live in. I invite you to take a step back to become aware of your biases and stereotypes and potential implicit discrimination. And how can you do so? How do you challenge your biases and stereotypes? Step number one is by becoming aware of them, which I hope I was able to help you achieve through this reflective slot. And second, by frequently taking a step back to reflect on those things, especially those of you who aim to work in, uh, in the helping professions. I invite you to get to know the people who are different from you, talk to them, be mindful of your discrimination. And I leave you with this open question. What biases might, might you hold and how can you challenge them? Thank you.